Okay, so we are going to do the Mexican Revolution, and to be honest, a lot more today. Um, I'm going to try and make this a streamlined presentation. Uh, there's a lot of people involved, a lot of names, um, but it's the general gist we need to understand. So the way I want to do this is I wanted to look at this as a CCOT, certain um, changes and continuities that occur uh, during this era of both period five and period six Mexico. So what were the changes? Why was there change? What were the continuities throughout this time? So here is my general thesis. The current condition of Mexico can be founded in the lack of successful resolution that came from the Mexican Revolution. Though dictatorship was ousted, its replacement has lacked the ability to promote long-term stability. So I'm talking about all the events that lead to Porfirio Diaz, but also the changes since Porfirio Diaz and the chaos um, that ensued. We do need to take a look back um, at how Mexico became a, a one-person dictatorship. And really, it, it lies in the political and economic uh, chaos that occurred after independence from Spain. Um, they have a very complex racial class structure um, that had seemingly pigeonholed people in groups for uh, generations. Well, Iturbide comes into power and leads as a dictator for an extremely short period of time. He will be quickly, uh, he will quickly uh, leave office, um, showing how hard this new independent Mexico will be to lead. Many of you will recognize the name Santa Ana because of the issues he had to deal with with the United States. He, too, was a, an autocrat. Um, he will have more highs and lows, but instead of dealing with domestic reform, I would liken him to having to deal with uh, regional and international crises. What crises? Well, first of all, you know, a third of Mexico leaves Mexico, and that is Texas. And, of course, Texas will then be annexed as part of the United States. The French will try to take Mexico. The United States tries to fight Mexico for land. A lot of these things have already been covered. Um, I think the big picture is in period five, the 1800s, people were looking, foreign nations, foreign corporations were looking at Mexico as um, what can I get from her? What land can I take from her? What oil-based commodity can I get from her? How can um, we expand our nation by um, dictating Mexico's future? Now, that's not to say there weren't attempts at reform. Benito Juarez is elected in president in 1858 as a person who was leftist. He was reform-minded. He is a child, if you will, of the Enlightenment. He, he was looking to bring uh, Mexico to a more Western Europe political structure. One of the attacks he had was on the church itself, thinking that the Roman Catholic Church w bore too much power over politics and economics and society. Mexico will suspend payment of foreign debt in 1861 in an attempt to deal with her own issues and not to kind of fall deeper into the dependency theory mentality. Now, France, Great Britain, and Spain are going to protest. So now we have an aftermath of that decision. The French will uh, occupy Mexico in 1861, capturing its capital of Mexico City in 1863. Louis Napoleon, uh, Louis Napoleon makes uh, Archduke Maximilian Emperor of Mexico in 1864. Now I want to just get a little, per, uh, you know, complex look at this. So this is what's happening in Mexico in 1864. The United States is falling towards the end of its own civil war. Um, Europe had just erupted in revolutions of 1848. 
Uh, what's going over there? Russia. Russia had just freed the serfs and is trying to balance its reform era towards its return to autocracy itself. So I want to make sure we understand that Mexico's chaos was indicative of the chaos going on around the world in period five. Now, Maximilian will not last very long. He is not of Mexico, though I actually believe that he had some good ideas for the nation and probably would have led it well. Um, the people never looked at him as of Mexico. He will be captured and executed. Juarez comes back to power. Now, the Juarez reform-minded movement will come to an end with the election, and I did rabbit ears on that, of Porfirio Diaz. Porfirio, D Porfirio Diaz is a wonderful Western-minded uh, leader in the sense that the West loves a strong man uh, who will lead his third world, his developing world nation, allowing the dependency theory to thrive. So Mexico is going to be a, a periphery nation because of Porfirio Diaz. He wants order and progress. He wants stability. This allows him to use foreign capital to develop his industry. This allows him to have railroads with foreign development. This allows him to... Um, go and dig and, and mine and such uh, for oil. I just said mine for oil, I know, um, because of foreign money. And if you think back to what we might have learned in ninth grade when we were talking about dollar diplomacy, when foreign nations have strong stakes in your economy, they're going to call the shots or pull the money. Now, Porfirio Diaz... Um, He's going to lead a nation where the, the, the richest get richer, the strongest get stronger. I had just said this with the Russian Revolution and Tsar Nicholas. But the actual Mexican worker, the actual Mexican person who's dealing hand and foot, sweat and labor, he's not feeling any real development. He has a job, but he doesn't have land. He doesn't have ownership of his future. Uh, the, poor, the poorest people, those who have some uh, native blood, do have very benefit. Uh, education stifled. Um, common land, or ejidos, is going to be confiscated by the government for the government. This leads to the Mexican Revolution. Now, earlier we had studied the Mexican Revolution in the sense of its independence movement, from Spain. This is more of the Mexican Revolution within her own border. So it's kind of a civil war, if you will, between the different groups or classes. Now, by 1910, large portions of Mexico society were fed up with Diaz. Those haciendas were being owned and controlled by um, only 5% of the population. So what had happened in the encomienda system, when the peninsulares and eventually the creoles get the land, that actually hasn't seemingly changed. If not, it's gotten worse over the last few hundred years. The rich get richer, okay? This is not a, a new theme in this era of revolution. Political, economic, and sur sur uh, social turmoil rises up. Porfirio Diaz sees the writing on the wall. Francisco Madero, he's going to lead a leftist movement against Diaz or an anything but Diaz movement. Diaz will be overthrown, and Madero comes into power in 1911, um, replacing Diaz. But then he too will be replaced because in 1911, 1912, there was no way he was going to be able to successfully uh, deliver on all the promises uh, he had made, that the revolutionaries had made. To be honest, Francisco Madero, if anything, he was a suit and tie revolutionary. He wasn't a, as you'll find, a Pancho Villa revolutionary. And now who am I talking about? I'm talking about Madero, Zapata, and Villa. These are three people who fought and desired change. And they all kind of had their different means, different methods. 
Emiliano Zapata is going to be a peasant leader in southern Mexico. He will develop the Plan de Aila. There's your good Spanglish on that one, which was a massive land reform, a very much a um, let's give the peasants small bits of land in a very revolutionary, communist, Marxist way. Um, these people that follow Zapata or the Zapatistas believe in land and liberty. Um, this isn't too different from Marxist uh, peace, land, and bread. And to be honest, um, it's what many Mexicans wanted to hear. The Porfirio Diaz of top-notch development did not benefit them, so why not go to a more grassroots effort? And that's where we get Pancho Villa, the guy on the right. Pancho Villa is going to organize the peasants in the north, and I am being very generic. Now, he was a little bit different, not politically oriented, more of a, as you see in my clicking, a Robin Hood, who was willing to rob the robber barons. He was willing to raid southern Texan land um, to take back what was uh, rightfully the Mexicans. So he is a steal from the rich and give to the poor. Both Zapata and Villa spoke for the revolutionary element of the revolution. So the question is, who's running all of this? Um, by 1913, Madero overthrown by the military and eventually assassinated, living to kind of a, a martyrdom. General Victorano Huerta will take the reins. Now think about the time and place. 1913, the United States lost an ally, and uh, Huerta is going to be anti-American, kind of the dependency theory kicking in, and Huerta's fighting that, willing to, if you will, work with the Germans. This is all in the era of World War I looming in the summer of 1914. Villa, Zapata, Carnanza, and Obregón will all lead a fight against Huerta because they don't think Huerta, in a kind of a fascist military rule, has the best um, intentions for the nation. The United States, in this era of moral diplomacy, will get involved in Mexico's issues using the banner of some problems um, with its soldiers in, in and near Veracruz. And the U.S. actually invades Veracruz. And that's Madeira. That's a weird link to have that click in at the end. Uh, now, in 1914, Huerta steps down. Carnanza, a more radical, he will be now the president, pushing forth a constitution. A reforms, the Constitution, and yes, Carnanza will be killed. Don't laugh. It is funny how everybody that seems to rise to power will die. Um, I don't think the Roman Empire liked that, and we all saw that as a symptom of its calamity. Uh, in 1920, Obregón overthrows and assassinates uh, Carnanza, and now we kind of have the end of the Mexican Revolution. In all of this, there is a conflict within um, the nation itself. The Catholic Church members fight for their faith uh, as the government and the Constitution limit their influence. And the Cristero War is a military conflict um, where you see on the right, uh, Long Live Christ the King. Roman Catholics wanted to return to their roots and make sure that this new liberal-minded constitution doesn't um, placate the secularists. Uh, just a little bit more. What had happened in the 19-teens doesn't really bode well for the emerging Mexican state uh, with Via um, raiding Americans, uh, we start to see that John Pershing, a future leader in World War I, will actually invade Mexico. And all of this shows the tensions between the United States still and this emerging Mexican state. Will it be our friend? Will it rule under our thumb? Or will it pull towards Europe? Or will we just kind of let it fall apart itself? 
Now, here is the Mexican Constitution of 1917, this revolutionary document. And I want you to, uh, to see that here. Universal suffrage, restrictions on foreign ownership, eight-hour day, minimum wage, agrarian reform, restricted on the church's power over property. So here it all. I mean, let's just go back to, you know, the 1700s, the 1780s, the early 19, uh, 1880s, 1800s, okay? Just think about what the French Revolution was about. And go all the way to the, Me uh, the, the Marxist revolutions and the, that concept. We have a desire to change the power structure of old Europe, even the old Europe that was alive in the New World. Minimum wage, peasant reform, limit the church, um, limit the dependency theory. Powerful document. Now, out of this quote-unquote powerful document will become one powerful party. The PRI, the Institutionalized Revolutionary Party, which will be the political party of Mexico for approximately 70 plus more years. Where we have to understand that like China, like Russia, Mexico is going to become a one-party state where real power doesn't lie in who's running for election, but who's running those elections, that one-party state. And in all of this uh, liberalness, and all of this infusion of conflict, you can see that uh, Diego Rivera uh, demonstrates it in art. It's a socially aware mural where Diego Rivera is showing revolutionaries, uh, leftist revolutionaries. This is his wife, uh, what's her name, Frida, um, holding some weapons and passing out the arms. How do I know it's her? She's got an unibrow that you would never, ever want. All right, that was a 17-minute presentation. Oh, forgot about this slide. Yeah, good teaching there. Um, it just kind of shows a little bit of uh, lasting impact of this era. The oil is going to be nationalized after this era. The U.S. and Mexico actually start developing relations. And in the end, most revolutionaries were assassinated. Class warfare led to change that actually didn't help classes too much. Just think about Mexico today. Corruption and constitution centralized under one political party that never works out. There's always a debate between the role of the church and the role of the state. There's always a commonality of U.S. intervention when she 